the wisdom aspect of our awareness. That's the feminine principle. And I think it's appropriate tonight we are doing meditation on the wisdom of emptiness, uh, which is perfectly appropriate, the Jakini principle. <clears throat> so first let's, I'm gonna do a supplication. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna do a, a supplication today to Parmasambhava and Lady Shishogyal and Lady Mandarava. Uh, <clears throat> the great enlightened Dakinis for their blessing that we can realize the Dakini awareness within us. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> there are many ways to approach our mind, how to understand the mind, you know. Of course, yesterday when we uh, were going through the Mundra teaching, uh, as I explained, the Mundra teaching, within the Mundra teaching, it explained that if we understand the nature of samsara, then we can, the, the right, the next door to samsara is nirvana. So you have to go through the samsara in order to understand nirvana. It's like you follow the horse footstep to find where the horse is. You know, if you lose your horse, then you need to follow the track, like American Indians supposed to, you know, who are very good in uh, tracking, trackers in the old days, the trackers, same thing. You just follow the track of the horse to know where the horse is. Same thing, you need to know the samsara nature and then you find uh, the next door is the entry to nirvana or liberation. So in a way, samsaric nature, we are all like expert in samsara, aren't we? We know the best of the best of our afflictions, how to function and how to cling, how to get trapped. And we're expert in all this thing, but we miss seeing that all the time, how we are getting trapped into that. And sometimes, unfortunately, we don't even realize not only one lifetime, but many lifetimes, how we remain in a sense of ignorance and the, how we get swayed away in that sense of ignorance. So therefore, we are very fortunate that when we meet the Dharma, uh, Dharma means seeing things clearly. That's what Dharma is. Generally, the meaning of the Dharma has like 10 meaning. Dharma, the, what we call sacred Dharma, the spiritual text whether it's the, you know, Hinayana text or Mahayana text or Vajrayana text or any spiritual teaching is called the sacred Dharma or the sacred spiritual uh, scriptures or teaching. But general Dharma means phenomena. In Sanskrit, Dharma means phenomena. To know, uh, uh, to knowing is also Dharma. To know is Dharma. Uh, path is Dharma. Nirvana is done. Uh, uh, imagination is done. Uh, the fortune is done. Life is a dharma. Uh, and future is a dharma. So dharma has still different meanings generally. Basically, it's kind of phenomenal. And uh, among those dharma, the dharma texts, when we talk about spiritual dharma, it's called the sacred dharma. So when we look at that, 
what, what they're trying to tell us is the future, whether it's future, whether it's life, whether it's future, you know, you need to, in future has no relevance without a subject. Past has no relevance without a subject. Becoming has no relevance without a subjective person. Uh, sacred texts, sacred scriptures have no meaning without a subject. So, so when we talk about subject, then we are talking about consciousness, a mind, a subjective mind. So therefore, phenomena has again no relevance without a consciousness, without a mind. So whether we talk about past in, in general, whether we talk about anything of past, anything of the future, anything the present, has to deal with the subjective awareness, who feels, who knows, who goes through the past, who goes through the present, who goes through the future. This subjective means is a mind. So therefore, knowing the mind is basically you know, we, we are trying to know the mind, you know, but what we are living in the mind at the same time. Our experience itself is the mind. It's, there's nothing beside the mind. As I said, if, if you do not exist, what is there? Not, there's no relevance with the phenomenon. The phenomenon is your own appearance. Like without your subjective awareness, there is uh, 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 none of the phenomena, including the sacred, uh, uh, sacred dharma, has no meaning at all. Uh, who experienced that? So when we talk about emptiness, you know, in emptiness, where it's defined in the sutra teaching, is defined as subjective emptiness and objective emptiness. Objective emptiness is the external phenomena where we try to investigate and where we try to analyze the meaning of phenomena by looking at the source of the objective appearance, which is atoms, uh, uh, atoms, particles, which is the formation of all external uh, phenomena. So when we look at any particle, let it be the particle of a tree, let it be a particle of a house, let it be a particle of the water or mountains, whatever. We, when we try to look into it, we do not find any objective which is inherently or independently exists. There is no such thing when we analyze. Even the scientists, when they try to look for a God particle, they never discover a God particle. What they see today is a probability and it's dependent particle in other words. So therefore, since there isn't any objective in reality on the externally, it seems to exist. Yes, it seems to exist. As much as it seems to exist in our dream. We see the mountain, we see the ocean in our dream, we see the cars, we see our house, all our phenomena, like in the daytime. But when we wake up, they were really just an experience of your mind. Nothing actually exists beside your mind. So subjective awareness, that's what I mean in this uh, mind-only school called Chitta Mantra school in Buddhist teaching. Mind-only school philosophy defined that the three world system is just your mind. Like the dream is just your mind. This phenomenon is also just your mind. As I'm saying, there may be all this, you know, thing what we label the, the world system or the planetary system or whatever the system. But if you don't, if you don't exist, your awareness, <clears throat> subjective person is not there. What is there to experience the phenomenon? This, as I said, is irrelevant. The, uh, the future is irrelevant. You know, the past is irrelevant uh, because it, it has no uh, function at that time. So what the point is here yeah, I'm trying to say is the mind is the one, the awareness is the one which experiences uh, this phenomena. And what we are trying to do, you know, like <clears throat> when we do meditation practice or when we do 
you know, uh, Tonglin practice, uh, like the spiritual sacred dharma, we are trying to understand the nature of phenomena. You know, the essential nature of phenomena. That's what we are trying to do. We are, we are going through the phenomena already. We don't have to look for phenomena. We are already in phenomena. But now the kind of phenomena we are going through, is it the right way we are going through or is it the wrong approach? We are seeing something which is in, in reality very different than what is, you know, or how we, it seems to be. Or is it in harmony? The appearance in reality in harmony or appearance in reality in uh, contradiction? If the, what it appears <clears throat> and what we see, what we go through, if it's in harmony, then there's perfect balance of yin and yang, so to speak. You know, <clears throat> the Korean or Chinese, they're called yin and yang or male and female, uh, uh, male and female, uh, you know, uh, phenomena, balance, or skillful meaning, wisdom, uh, in union, oneness. The, the fact when we don't see the oneness, when we see the separation of these two uh, uh, male uh, aspect and feminine aspect, you know, then there is a conflict. How things appear, and how we see. And if how things appear and how we see a union, then there's harmony. How things appear and how we see it, there's contradiction, then there's conflict in our mind. Naturally, we all we, we can all see that in our day-to-day -day life situation. You know, what you imagine, what you assumption, we say, oh, I assume it wrong. I, I thought it was like that, but it turned out to be different. You see the conflict we go through. So anyway, the mind only schools say that the three world system is just simply the mind, you know, because without the subjective mind, there is nothing really to uh, experience. There is no one to see that. So when the emptiness is explained in the Sutra teaching, Sutra is a very logical teaching. It explains about the two parts, objective emptiness and subjective emptiness. So objectively, when you analyze, there isn't any inherent quality, independent quality. Then you look at the uh, subjective quality. Objectively, you didn't find any particle which is inherent, independent. Now, you, then you look at the subjective mind. Mind also, it goes through so much like filter, so to speak, you know. The speed of the mind, you cannot hold anything as independent in the mind also, in an, even for an instant. For example, the, the dualistic phenomena, the conditioned phenomena, there's no place that it can remain, even for an instant. How is that example put, even for an instant, that there is no independent state in the flow of the continuum of the thoughts. It's like a 64 petal, 64 petals pile up together, a flower, 64 flower petal pile up together. And you snap a finger, which is like an instant. When you, the example of instant is a snap of a finger. So snap of a finger, you, uh, you, know, you snap a finger and you hold a needle on your other hand. And 64 petal is here. When you snap a finger, you pierce that uh, needle, it will go through 64 petals in one instant. So, so what I show the speed, the lightning speed, there must be some scientific word for that, you know, I don't know that terminology, but it's so fast that that one split of a second, 64 petals, when the 64 petal from one to the second petal, second to the third petal, or from 10 to the 20th and 20 to the 30th, and so on, it's moving so fast that where do you find uh, an independent, uh, independent uh, uh, subjective, uh, uh, that conditioned mind that we can hold on to? We cannot. So it shows 
that whether from the objective point, there's no inherent independent state, whether from the subjective point, there's no independent inherent state, is utterly open. So then, so you see, in our world, when we talk about eternalism, when we talk about eternalism, we are talking about something independent, whether it's subjective or whether it's objective. And we know that you know there's nothing, uh, ob there's nothing independent in objective. But somehow we tend to think that my mind is independent. There must be something very that I can hold on to, you know. But that is, that is, uh, I think it's totally unnecessary to do that. And I can give a, uh, let me try to give an example why that is unnecessary. There are two things, you know, mind, when you look at the, uh, when we look at the mind, for example, when we work with, uh, work with our afflictions, neurosis, you know, when you, you can eliminate afflictions, you can eliminate neurosis by seeing its essence. So, you know, for example, we can suppress neurosis. We all know we can do that. As I, as I give the example, you know, uh, a desire we can suppress by uh, impurities and aggression we can suppress by kindness and then uh, ignorance we can suppress by interdependence. So those are just like general, uh, general teaching explain how to overcome our uh, gross, uh, gross uh, afflictions. Uh, but but you, you can suppress uh, and you can eliminate, not only suppress, but you can eliminate the neurosis and affliction by seeing emptiness. But you can never suppress the awareness or means uh, mind's clarity. Mind is a two aspect. One is emptiness and one is clarity, awareness. It's simply, you know, it's open. Awareness is not just like, doesn't necessarily mean, uh, oh, uh, I know uh, a particular imagination or a particular fantasy, a particular thought. You know, that is uh, arising. Of course, that arising comes out of clarity of the mind or the mind able to express things. So in other words, you can, you can eliminate affliction, but you can never eliminate expression of mind. You can never, uh, you know, you can fall into nihilism, but still there is an expression of mind, it's a confused expression of mind. Or you can see a clarity and uh, like a cosmic love, or like, like a, a accelerating, you know, infinite mind, but still that is an expression. So awareness, Mind's quality of awareness is there's no death. It just doesn't die. You cannot burn. It's not an object that you can burn or you can destroy. Or you, it, it is like the awareness itself is nothing can, there's no antidote to stop that. But there is always antidote for a, affliction and neurosis, how to stop. It. So now by seeing that, it really helps us to see that our ego, the grasping, the clinging, that we like to hold on to something is really the notion is basically a fear in our mind. And of course, the ego can only survive based on fear. Ego cannot survive if it is not based on fear. All affliction survives on fear. Without fear, afflictions wouldn't have the power. So when you're doing meditation, you're simply, you know, working with your mind natural state. From a very beginning level, shamatha level, before you go to the vipassana level or extraordinary insight level, you're working from a very, you know, basic, learning the basic, how your mind flows. When you leave your mind in its natural flow, how does the mind reacts to you? How does the mind flows with you? That's what we're learning in meditation. And that helps us to overcome 
confusion, and that helps us to overcome fear. And all the rest of the affliction which comes to that. And when all the rest of the affliction subside by letting the mind be naturally as it is supposed to be, then all affliction goes down, then all suffering goes away. That's where you can rest. It makes your mind calm, it makes your mind relax, and you experience the attributes of the mind, fundamental qualities such as clarity, such as bliss, such as like infinity openness, but without having to cling to. And of course, the clinging will come. We are used to clinging and grasping so much. For example, you know, when you begin to shift, when you begin to experience shifting of your mind from panic, from disorder, from chaos, from fear that we are used to so much, then when we experience instead of fear, joy, instead of like narrowness, openness, then of course we will get attached to that. It's natural. Because you're seeing something now, joy, you want to retain that. that you want to hold on to that. You don't want to lose it. And of course, that's the right thing you're doing. But then again, in the meditation teaching, you know, the way to do with the mind is, okay, it's fine, but you don't make a big deal. You don't cling to that bliss. Neither you cling to that openness or cling to bliss, whatever. Allow the mind, you do not suppress the mind or you don't rough, uh, go after the mind. Just remain in the meditation awareness itself. And that will maintain your uh, awareness. And the pristine quality of your mind will shine naturally. Of all the, you know, like we have ozone problem today in the world due to environmental degradation. How are we going to heal? How are we going to purify and repair the damage that all the chemicals and environmental degradation is done. We cannot, you know, throw some other chemicals to get rid of another chemical that we may be able to do it, but that's not gonna help the natural condition of the ozone state. The best way is to clear it by natural, by not polluting, but, you know, by respecting the way, let the nature heal by itself. So meditation is let the nature of your mind heal by itself. Meditation is healing within you by your own natural state of mind. It's not a physical form that, you know, a doctor can give an injection or, or you know, cut your injuries and throw it away and put a bandage. When you deal with the mind, you've got to know how the mind works and how to deal with the mind. So therefore, you know, practice of meditation is really the only way that how you can address your mind and how you, how you can work with your mind. So every day meditation becomes extremely important. If you can relate with that, then your mind, you know, will come to a natural state and it will heal by itself. You are inherently, you know, in the Buddhist teaching, it's called the Buddha nature. Buddha means awaken. That's what it means. You have an awaken of basic goodness within you. And that basic goodness is the source of your natural healing. And whoever focuses more to the basic goodness or the Buddha nature means your basic goodness. And that has been introduced by the teacher, how to remain in meditation. And then when you focus to that, the mind will achieve. You have no choice rather than to experience bliss, openness, and freedom and liberation. Even if you don't want it, it will happen. Versus right now, we are constantly in a state of conflict aggression, affliction, neurosis, and then we expect a freedom. We expect joy. We experience liberation. We experience joy. It's never going to happen. It will never happen for the next 10 billion years. <laughs> that sounds long enough, isn't it? You want me to go longer? 
uh, x another zero, you can add another zero too, if you like. <laughs> or another four more zeros. It can never happen in infinite time. As long as we remain in neurosis, the mind will continuously go through the neurosis. There's no savior at all outside. You are the only savior who can do it. But you need support, you need guidance, you need a teacher, you need to do the practice. As we say, you need a guide for a horse to, for the horse to take to the water. There is a horseman has to lead the horse to the river and then the horse can drink the water. But it's up to the horse. When the horse get to the river to drink the water, not it's up to totally to the horse. Same thing, a teacher can guide you but you have to do it. So then when you let the mind be in its right natural state, it will come. Clear, clear voice, intuition, openness, freedom, transcending from neurosis, affliction, they're all naturally there. You have that quality within you, in your mind. You never have to you know, seek that from outside, it's within you, but you have to see that. So therefore meditation practice becomes very important. Today, you know, even on the scientific level, they don't go to the deepest level as far as the mind is concerned. They're like, like at a baby, baby sitters, you know, right now like a kindergarten level sciences, as far as the mind is concerned, subjective awareness is concerned. But they also come to understand medical, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, scientific medical reviews says that those who have a deeper level of meditation, their immune system get built up, their blood pressure goes down. That's how much it affects your body, speech, and mind. Meditation. So if those, you know, really all being, as long as there is a consciousness, as long as there is a mind, is the only way how we can get to our freedom, liberation that we all seek. Everyone seek happiness. It only comes within you by understanding how to how to let the mind be as it is. So meditation practice becomes very very important, very powerful. So <clears throat> then. Like in post meditation state, like, you know, after we get up from our zafu and then we form our sitting meditation posture, then when we go out in the world and try to relate with people and uh, whatever our activities are concerned, uh, you know, that we should bring uh, more uh, compassionate uh, uh, practice. Uh, noble, you know, as part of, such as in the mind of teaching, before immeasurable practice, immeasurable kindness, immeasurable uh, compassion, immeasurable uh, rejoice, immeasurable equanimity, and then the act of generosity, like in today, particularly in this pandemic time, so many people are going through so many difficult times. So like whatever act of kindness and compassion large or small doesn't matter as long as we make an effort to do the best of our ability to help community or people or whatever we can do you know and those are great merit you know it is the mer the merit is a very important thing in the teaching of buddha uh, uh, the question was asked to buddha how to overcome poverty whether it is a physical poverty or whether it is a mental poverty. Of course, mental poverty, we can overcome through meditation, deeper level of those. But for example, when we look at the physical poverty, one can overcome physical poverty by the act of kindness or being generosity. Because the opposite of generosity is miser, stingy, some people have so much wealth, neither they can use it for any good purpose, nor they can you know, use it for themselves. They die, and when they die, there's nothing they can carry. 
So it's a waste. It's like a money where there is no use at all. So while you are still living, while it's in your hand, that you can do something good with that. Wherever you want to give a charity or some, you know, as I said, in the pandemic time, like food bank. A lot of families today are going without food. So if he, you know, it doesn't have to be much bigger, any scale that one can afford. Maybe just go and give like, you know, $10, you know, to the food bank or $20, whatever. It will help. And then it makes you strong. And as a result of cause and effect, that you get more abundance. And when you get more abundance, the, then again, in the according uh, to the Mayan Sutra, it is very important to dedicate the merit for the enlightenment and happiness of all beings. That is very important. Because you may create some very positive thing that builds the energy. You know, anything you do, positive or negative, it builds the energy. So when you do something very uh, positive thing, and then it builds a very powerful positive energy, but if that is misguided, misdirected, after you do an act of compassion, act of generosity, then if you do not dedicate, and let's say right after that you meet a circumstance, somebody challenge you, or you get so angry, you get so angry, and then you, are, you go crazy, but after doing an act of some generosity, act of any generosity, anything good, then that it will create a phenomenon which cannot be very good. And if you, I can give you example, power. You know, power do not come without a cause. Do you think anything come in this world without a cause? Think about it. Ask yourself the question. Things come just happen without any cause? Or things come with a cause? I mean, when we look at it like the, you know, uh, flower, the, uh, the red, red flower or yellow flower or purple flower or pine trees versus a nut tree or apple trees. In, if you want an apple, you need to put the seed of the apple tree. The only apple will grow, not a pine tree out of it. A pine tree will not give the uh, uh, rose flower. You need to plant the rose flower seed. Every phenomena has its own cause and effect. To think that things happen randomly without any cause, it never really exists in the universe. It's out of the law and order of the universe. So how things happen? What everything happening in your life has a cause and effect. I mean, whether it's your happiness or whether it's your pain or whether whatever condition you're going through, it's, you have created that condition for you, for you to experience that. That's called the, you know, the undeniable power of cause and effect, the truth of cause and effect. So therefore, <clears throat> now, you know, sometimes my mind goes blank. <laughs> I'm just trying to explain. So cause and effect, we are talking cause and effect. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, so generosity, we were talking. Uh, so when you, when you create a condition, uh, it's just not condition. When we, when we are talking condition, it involves other factors, not just one factor. For example, when you put the seed of a pine tree, it, it involves a seed, it involves water, it involves the right time of, you know, care and everything and no animals come and eat that, you know, so, it, so many factors. Same thing, when you do some act of kindness, act of generosity, and after that you get so angry right away, for some cause, doesn't matter, anything, it can happen, anything, someone didn't respond, respect you for what your act of kindness was. You know, uh, I was in New York in 1983, and I came from India at that time. I was walking in the street, 
Yeah, I think I have, I didn't have much money. So I have five cents, you know, in my hand that day. Uh, the beggar, I met someone in the street. I gave him five cents. And he added another five cents on top of that and give back to me. <laughs> but I was really genuine. That's all I have, you know. <laughs> but I think I offended. But if, you know, I could easily take as an offense, you know. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, fortunately, you know, I didn't. But anyway, something like that. So let's say you, you give someone a house on a bigger scale and someone say, oh, that's not good enough. Then how would you get? You will get angry, for example. You know, this is too much. And so then instantly that good merit is like a good, good big pot of fresh milk. You add one sour milk, the whole milk will become sour, for example. Right? It'll be not good. You can still drink that. It may be become cheese or something, but definitely not fresh milk. And that's the kind of like we see people in this world, such as what happened with Saddam Hussein, what happened with Gaddafi, what happened with Stalin, Hitler, who came in this world have tremendous power. Where do you think their power came from? Even they were so evil. What's the cause of their power? They did something good also in the past life that good give them their power and their wealth and the strength, but due to something negative, they were, instead of using energy in the right channel, they using the wrong channel, and then they did mass destruction. So all start with the mind. The point here is everything starts from our mind. Why we really need to understand this mind, that it doesn't make our own situation a destructive state, and as well as other people. So mind is very powerful. You can be the Lord of the universe, a destructive one. And then finally, once you do a destruction, you, you saw you know, how Hitler has died in a bunker. He could kill himself, which is the last resort, the desperation, the lowest of the lowest from the height of the power and to the uh, killing oneself in a little bunker. And we saw the same thing with Saddam Hussein. And then many other people, you know, on a smaller scale happening, in our, you know, within our own country, within our community, within like in a family too, how we can see destructive quality destroy our life. And that's all how we have not dedicated in the right way. So dedication becomes important. The point here I'm trying to make mm -hmm. is when you do anything good, you should make that merit. You create an energy. That's called good, good energy is called merit. So when you create a merit, you must make a prayer or wish, you know, something like the American Indians. I think they have a very good, uh, you know, system. Like when you get an animal, you thank the animal for the meat instead of aggression. Of course, killing anything is not good, but at least instead of aggression, you thank it, you know? So like when we, you know, when we do any act of kindness, any good thing, we must dedicate that, may this become merit, may become a uh, seed of enlightenment, freedom for all beings, and may there be abundance and happiness that are dedicated for all beings. And wherever I am, I am a Bodhisattva aspiration, wherever I am, may beings find happiness. People just seeing me find happiness or anything, they turn into happiness. In that way, then you become that. You become what your mind makes you up. That's what you become. So that is just like, you know, the, uh, of course, it's not meditation, uh, but it's part of the Dharma teaching. How we need to, you know, you know, every day we involve a lot of action, how we can transform the action into positive energy. That's also part of our uh, well-being, part of our meditation. Okay, so then now uh, meditation, as I earlier explained, uh, how the mind should be, you know, uh, when we, 
we need the uh, posture in order to understand the mind. Uh, we need to go through with the body. So the body posture should be proper when you do sitting meditation. Uh, best is you do in a cross leg. If you can't do in a cross leg, you can do it in a chair or, or, where, or whatever is comfortable, uh, but a little bit firm so you don't fall asleep while sitting on a chair or a sofa set. A little bit firm so it kind of keeps your mind awake instead of sinking down. And then once you uh, sit in the right posture, then now relax your mind, relax your body. Also your clothes, the kind of clothes you wear shouldn't be tight. It should be kind of like a baggy sort of, you know, loose, like exercise clothes, like track suits or whatever. Very relaxed. And then your body, you know, in your body is my mind. You should think that. In my body is my mind. And my mind relaxes. It's like you drop the whole thing. Right now we are tense. Usually we are tense. Always we are tense in our body, tense in our mind. Now you want to drop the whole tense. You know, you drop your body and you drop your mind. Just like that, on the spot. So you are here and now. Instead of your mind going somewhere else and you know, going in the past, going in the future. Uh, or, no, you are here and now. In my body is my mind, and my mind relax, not tense, totally, utterly open, like relax. And then now you go to the breathing. Then the next thing is when you now you your mind should be with your breath. So when you breathe through your nose, when you breathe out, and when you breathe in, just have your awareness with the breath. You know. And just focus one pointed concentration to that. Not in a tense way, but in a very natural way. Just be there, just be aware with the breath. Then, of course, you cannot be with that same state of mind all the time. Some thoughts will arise. Either the thought of the past, or thought of the future, or some movement of thought will arise. Before, you know, for a moment, you experience stillness. You know, when you first started doing it, there was some level of stillness. The mind just remained with the awareness and just with the breath, that's all. But then after some time from the stillness, the, now the mind has shifted the gear to the movement. Movements mean thought arising, you know, something arising in your mind, whether it's your past or future. Mostly it's past and future because present one cannot be. Present is so hard. Right now, you, you may not be able to live in your present state of mind. But very short period, as you keep doing your meditation, you will come to remain in your present state of mind. So anyway, so now what happened? So when the past thought or future thought happens, you don't need to panic. You don't need to beat yourself. You don't have to go through the guilt. Oh, that is not right. I did a mistake. You don't need to do that. Moment you recognize your the shift from stillness to movement happened, that itself is good enough. Moment you recognize, then the mind will go back again to the stillness, to the awareness. Mind will go back to the Then again, sit like that. Then again, a thought will arise again. You don't suppress the thought, or you don't go after the thought. If you go after the thought, then you have lost your ground. So you are now with the movement of the thoughts, whether in the past or whether in the future. Then if that happens, then one thought will lead to the next, next will lead to the next. It's called like, uh, uh, like a bead. You know, bead or the wheel keeps spinning around and like never there's an exit. So what's happening in our life, we always want some freedom, but we don't feel free. We feel tense all the time because we have no exit. It's like you're driving around, the driving around without any exit. And sometimes the tires blow up, the engines get heat, and then you go crazy. And then you call AAA, they never show up. <laughs> 
and then you are hungry, you are thirsty, and then the whole thing is chaos. That's the experience of life, samsaric do mind. So therefore, when the thoughts movement arise, just recognize it, and you don't want to go, because then if you try to ask questions, oh, this is not right, then you go through the guilt, then you go through this, then this endless uh, unnecessary uh, observation. It's called unnecessary observation. Because you just saw what you need to do. You saw the moment, you saw a thought arise, and then you just, just recognize that and just again, go to the awareness. Then as you keep doing, keep doing, at some point you will find the balance. Then mind, you know, because you have never suppressed the thought, don't worry, you will have, you know, some people say, oh, if I don't think about how can be artistic? How can, how can I be creative? You will be like a thousand times more creative, being open and free, than uh, being timid and being in a cage. The creative quality, the artistic quality of a free mind versus artistic quality of a cage mind is a day and night difference. In Latin activity manifests versus neurotic activity manifests. So therefore, all you have to do is go back to your awareness and try to remain in the stillness. And then again, you don't force yourself in stillness. Sometime I thought, not every day your meditation will be safe. Someday it will be very smooth. Someday it may be rough, like an ocean wave. Not all the time the ocean remain in the same pattern. Someday the ocean is very calm. Someday it's very, very rough. But actually they're both the same. It really makes, in actuality, there's no difference. No matter how much the ocean is rough, it may have like a hundred feet waves versus like a five inch wave. Wave is simply a wave. It has to come down to its basic ground. No matter how high the wave is, it has to come down to its basic ground. Or how small the wave is, it will also come down to the basic ground. Basic ground is the same. Where it, where it functions is the same. So as you keep sitting, if you keep sitting, once you get some stability in your mind, then you can find the calmness joy, blissfulness, clarity, you know, openness, freedom, but naturally it will come to you, it's in your mind. So this is how you do meditation. So let's do a meditation now. Okay, everyone, you sit in your right posture. You know, <clears throat> I normally suggest don't close your eyes. But if you feel, uh, you know, more comfortable, you can do that, but then don't fall asleep. But best is to open your eyes. And then when you meditate, slightly look down, like on the tip of your nose, without any heart penetration, just like relax. You watch, watch on the tip of your nose and you drop the whole thing, like a total relax. No penetration outside, no penetration inside. Like, like you drop it, like, like a calm, naturally, you know, uh, uh, when you drop the whole thing, then there is not much movement. You know, the movement can happen whatever. If the movement, as I said, not every day it will be the same. Someday you may experience rough seas, someday you may experience calm seas. But as far as the ground of the sea itself is the same. So it doesn't matter. Once you know how to let the mind ease, it can go up and down, will not have effect on you. So that's what the senior meditation student experience. When you first start meditation, and after like months and years, you see a shift in your mind. The things which really bothers you before, no longer bothers you. Because your mind is at peace now. 
And before, the ill small thing can irritate you. But now at some point, even big things do not seem to affect all of us. Because you're able to feel those thoughts. Okay. So then now, let's do the sitting practice. Uh, sit in the uh, straight posture, your back. And then relax your body. And tell yourself, in my, on my, in my body, in my body is my mind, and my mind relax. Or you can say, on the zafu or on the chair, wherever you're sitting, on the zafu is my body. In my body is my mind, and my mind relax. Now you drop the breathing. And then just be with your breath, and just be aware of it. No tense. Total relax. And then if a thought arises, go back to the awareness. The mindfulness will tell you once you get distracted. Any kinds of thought. Don't run after the thought. That's the problem. We run after the thoughts. Just go back to your awareness with the thought. And be still with it. Okay? So let's do it. Let your mind be in complete rest. Don't even look for a result. Don't look, okay, now I should have bliss. I should have clarity. I should be free. Don't even give the demand to your mind. Drop all demand to your mind. And just sit and be. Rest with your awareness.
<clears throat> okay. So then, if you have any questions, we can have a discussion here. Any questions? I have a question, Rinpoche. Yes, yes. Um, about dedicating merit as you're going about your daily life. Um, there's so many times during the day that we do things for others. And if we're, if we're just chopping wood and carrying water, so to speak, uh, and doing our, you know, feeding the kitties or whatever, do you, are you saying just, I don't know what, please clarify that for me a little, the dailiness of what we do for others. When you do an act of compassion, first of all, you don't have to take credit. We have to keep a very clear line there. You know, taking credit is uh, ego's way of life. And in, in that way, we, you know, we make the whole thing kind of sour at the same time. Because mm -hmm. the moment you get back to ego's world, then ego, create, ego is a affliction and then you're adding more to affliction. The point here, when you do a great act of kindness or great act of compassion or generosity or anything, then you want to dedicate that merit. Let's say you go to Salvation Army, or you go to the food bank, and then you give your amount of food or whatever you want to give there, then you make a dedication. May it truly benefit being, and may I able to, you know, always until achieve in freedom, absolute freedom of enlightenment, may always be on the path to do good for others, may never able to do harm. And so you make dedication like that. In that way, you're always, your mind is infused in the Bodhisattva way of life. And that's what we need to train ourselves. Uh, so that's what I mean. When we do something great, we should dedicate the merit you know, and the proper dedication is Manjushri, Bodhisattva Manjushri, Avalokishvara, Tara, how they have, you know, dedicate their merit for the happiness of enlightenment all being. Even we can't do that, but let's make our genuine, you know, aspiration may really help being whatever I do and may I continuously do good. And may I never become someone who will harm being. Even if I have a negative thought, may that never mature may I always be on the path of kindness, bodhisattva way of life. That prayers are very powerful. Then you seal your merit into that aspiration. Yeah, you. you're welcome. It's like in a big ocean, you know, a drop of water goes in that ocean, that until that ocean does not dry up, that drop of ocean will not dry up. But if, you know, if the merit that which is not dedicated, is like a drop of ocean drop on the sand, on the beach, it will dry up very quickly. So it will give a result one time, but then it will go away. But the merit which is dedicated, you know, in the awareness of enlightened mind, since due to our obscuration of dualistic afflictions and ego, we do not really know how to make a genuine dedication. It's very hard, very, very hard. Let me give you an example, how ego minds function. Typically ego has a three way of looking at life. 
when we meet people who are more rich, more powerful, more beautiful, more powerful, whatever, people feel a little bit of jealous. You know, there's, you can see there's a sense of jealousy. When we meet someone equal to us, we feel a little competitiveness. When we see someone lower than us, we kind of look down on others. So maybe you may not have that, but once you start to engage with a person, then you come to know their situation, then those afflictions will come. That's how the weakness of the ego mind is like. There's definitely a weakness. There's definitely affliction. That's called neurosis. Because that traps you. It makes you small. It brings you suffering. So then how can we imagine an enlightened dedication, a bodhisattva dedication for the infinite beings, for their happiness and for their well-being? It's very hard. At least when you train a lot on the path, you can, you know, at least come out of, you know, uh, those affliction and uh, and then you deeply you know have some kind of awakening and then step by step by step on the path then your minds transform from that small ego mind into much open mind a bodhisattva kind of mind. so therefore uh, many times a dedication is made like the dedication of Madhushri like bodhisattva Madhushri make dedication I likewise make dedication like Bodhisattva Manjushri made aspiration and make aspiration like. So in, on top of that, you can add your own aspiration for your father, for your mother, for your friends, family, you know, for the whole world. Right now, it's so easy. Really, I think, you know, of course, when it's not the question that we, that, you know, we should have a deep sense of compassion for all being. Uh, but somehow we don't normally seem to see that. Only like in a, like a, when it's critical time, like now pandemic situation. If you go on the YouTube today, if you watch and what's happening in India, your compassion will arise if you see those, uh, what's going on, uh, death and no medicine. People go to hospital, they're turned away because there's no bed. If they go in the hospital, there's no oxygen. And they go inside, there's no medicine. People are dying. They said dead bodies are put like in kilometer. People are fighting to just simply cremate the body. There's no place to cremate the body. Parking lots are made place for cremation. People say we have money, but no medicine. We have money, but no oxygen. Incredible what's, and those kind of things, sometimes really make us, brings out, you know, what, how can I do something? So it's not just in India, it's happening in many other parts of the world. So I think we should, uh, uh, you know, uh, Buddhist, uh, uh, we need to train our mind. That's also, I think, is a teaching. When we see this thing, we realize our condition today, we in America, we are so blessed compared to some other countries. At the moment, there's vaccination, and some may take vaccination, some may not take this people's own decision, you know, uh, uh, some have their own opinion, but at least it's there if you want to take. But there is, if you don't want, there is oxygen there. <laughs> sure, all hospitals have oxygen. In India, there's no oxygen. So, uh, you know, those kind of things, it ch changes our mind. And then that's for us to feel a sense of deep compassion and caring only when we see them. But for bodhisattvas, they see that all the time. They see that all the time because when they see the nature of affliction and neurosis, you know, how it is instilled and how it is like infused and happening in our mind all the time, they feel tremendous compassion because when they see the egolessness state, which is replaced by the bodhicitta, the great compassion and wisdom, they have nothing else when they see beings caught up in ego, just like continuously 
caring and loving compassion all the time. And that's really, we have that nature, basic goodness. That's what means basic goodness. Basic goodness doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you try to be a little bit of kind and you know how to wear a proper dress and act clean and nice. That's not basic goodness. That's more like imitation of basic goodness. But the genuine basic goodness is your awareness, your sense of uplifting your mind from the ego's condition. Your basic inherent quality, which is fundamentally good. And we know that because when we study the dependent origination, there's no such thing as eternally, eternally bad because they're devout of inherent independent existence. Any emotion, any thoughts, any ego, uh, true nature is no self. But we experience a self and that's called obscuration, that's called ignorance. As long as we remain in the ignorance, there's no end to suffering. There's no end to like it, obscured phenomena. And that's what we're constantly fighting in our own mind, like we fight in our own dream. In your dream, you're, no matter what you see, you're fighting, you're fighting your own mind. You're fighting nobody else, you're fighting yourself. And that's probably happening in the, during the daytime too. <laughs> Next question. Okay, then, thank you. So let's dedicate the merit. Whatever we have to do, meditate, the positive merit or energy we create, let's dedicate that, you know, to us all being that they find happiness, they find liberation. Temporal happiness, food, shelter, medicine, oxygen, whatever they need, made that happen. Ultimate happiness, freedom from neurosis in ego. And so let's make dedication. In the world in general, and in this nation, may not even the names, disease, famine, war, and suffering be there. May virtuous qualities and merit and prosperity greatly increase. And may continuous good fortune and sublime well being perfectly allowed. In the world in general and in this nation, may not even the names, disease, famine, war, and suffering be. May virtuous qualities and merit and prosperity greatly increase. And may continuous good fortune and sublime well being perfectly allowed. In the world in general and in this nation, May not even the names, disease, famine, war, and suffering. May virtuous qualities and merit and prosperity be And may continuous good fortune and sublime well being. By this merit, may all beings, all beings gain omniscience and thus defeat the neurosis. And Please read that. Yeah. By this merit, may all beings. Uh, no, I'm forgetting it. The, by this merit, may all being achieve omniscience, thus defeat the neuroses, which are the source of uh, what is the it? Neurosis Somebody's and thing. negative actions, which are yeah. the, are the enemies. Yeah. From, From the, the turbulent, turbulent waves of birth, of old, birth age, old age, sickness, sickness and, and death. death. <laughs> From the ocean of cyclic existence, may all beings be liberated. Yeah, thank you. That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, then. Everyone take care. Okay. All right. Then. Thank you, Rinpoche. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Rinpoche. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Rinpoche. Be well. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. You Rinpoche. too. Please take care. <laughs> Thank you. I'll get to see you. Okay. Bye-bye. Good. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>